in philosophy, term logic, also known as traditional logic, syllogistic logic or Aristotelian logic, is a loose name for the way of doing logic that began with Aristotle and that was dominant until the advent of modern predicate logic in the late 19th century. This entry is an introduction to the term logic needed to understand philosophy texts written before predicate logic came to be seen as the only formal logic of interest. Readers lacking a grasp of the basic terminology and ideas of term logic can have difficulty understanding such texts, because their authors typically assumed an acquaintance with term logic. Aristotle's system, Aristotle's logical work is collected in the six texts that are collectively known as the Organon. Two of these texts in particular, namely the prior analytics and de interpretation, contain the heart of Aristotle's treatment of judgments and formal inference and it is principally this part of Aristotle's works that is about term logic. Modern work on Aristotle's logic builds on the tradition started in 1951 with the establishment by Jan Lucas Nierich of a revolutionary paradigm. The Jan Lucas Nierich approach was reinvigorated in the early 1970s by John Corcoran and Timothy Smiley, which informs modern translations of prior analytics by Robin Smith in 1989 and Gisela Stryker in 2009. Basics, the fundamental assumption behind the theory is that propositions are composed of two terms, hence the name two-term theory, or term logic and that the reasoning process is in turn built from propositions, the term is a part of speech representing something, but which is not true or false in its own right, such as man, or mortal. The proposition consists of two terms, in which one term is affirmed, or denied of the other, and which is capable of truth or falsity. The syllogism is an inference in which one proposition follows of necessity from two others. A proposition may be universal or particular, and it may be affirmative or negative. Traditionally, the four kinds of propositions are A type, universal and affirmative, I type, particular and affirmative, E type, universal and negative, O type, particular and negative. This was called the fourfold scheme of propositions. Aristotle's original square of opposition, however, does not lack existential import. A type, universal and affirmative, I type, particular and affirmative, E type, universal and negative, O type, particular and negative. In the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy article, The Traditional Square of Opposition, Terence Parsons explains. One central concern of the Aristotelian tradition in logic is the theory of the categorical syllogism. This is the theory of two premised arguments in which the premises and conclusion share three terms among them, with each proposition containing two of them. It is distinctive of this enterprise that everybody agrees on which syllogisms are valid. The theory of the syllogism partly constrains the interpretation of the forms. For example, it determines that the A-form has existential import, at least if the I-form does. For one of the valid patterns is, every C is B, every C is A, so, some A is B, this is invalid if the A-form lacks existential import, and valid if it has existential import. It is held to be valid, and so we know how the A-form is to be interpreted. One then naturally asks about the O-form. What do the syllogisms tell us about it? The answer is that they tell us nothing. This is because Aristotle did not discuss weakened forms of syllogisms, in which one concludes a particular proposition when one could already conclude the corresponding universal. For example, he does not mention the form, no C is B, every A is C, so, some A is not B, if people had thoughtfully taken sides for or against the validity of this form, that would clearly be relevant to the understanding of the O form but the weakened forms were typically ignored. One other piece of subject matter bears on the interpretation of the O form. People were interested in Aristotle's discussion of infinite negation, which is the use of negation to form a term from a term instead of a proposition from a proposition. In modern English we use non for this. We make non horse, which is true for exactly those things that are not horses. In medieval Latin non and not are the same word and so the distinction required special discussion. It became common to use infinite negation, and logicians pondered its logic. Some writers in the 12th century and 13th centuries adopted a principle called conversion by contraposition. It states that, 
every s is p is equivalent to every non p is non s, some s is not p is equivalent to some non p is not non s. Unfortunately, this principle conflicts with the idea that there may be empty or universal terms. For in the universal case, it leads directly from the truth, every man is a being, to the falsehood, every non being is a non man, which is false because the universal affirmative has existential import, and there are no non beings. And in the particular case it leads from the truth, a chimera is not a man to the falsehood, a non-man is not a non-chimera. These are, Jean Buridan's examples, used in the 14th century to show the invalidity of contraposition. Unfortunately, by Buridan's time the principle of contraposition had been advocated by a number of authors. The doctrine is already present in several 12th century tracts, and it is endorsed in the 13th century by Peter of Spain whose work was republished for centuries, by William Sherwood, and by Roger Bacon. By the 14th century, problems associated with contraposition seem to be well known, and authors generally cite the principle and note that it is not valid, but that it becomes valid with an additional assumption of existence of things falling under the subject term. For example, Paul of Venice in his eclectic and widely published Logica Parva from the end of the 14th century gives the traditional square with simple conversion but rejects conversion by contraposition, essentially for Buridan's reason. Term, a term is the basic component of the proposition. The original meaning of the horos is extreme, or boundary. The two terms lie on the outside of the proposition, joined by the act of affirmation or denial. For early modern logicians like Arnold, it is a psychological entity like an idea, or concept. Mill considers it a word. To assert all Greeks are men is not to say that the concept of Greeks is the concept of men, or that word Greeks is the word men. A proposition cannot be built from real things or ideas, but it is not just meaningless words either. Proposition, in term logic, a proposition is simply a form of language, a particular kind of sentence in which the subject and predicate are combined, so as to assert something true or false. It is not a thought, or an abstract entity. The word propositio is from the Latin, meaning the first premise of a syllogism. Aristotle uses the word premise as a sentence affirming or denying one thing or another, so a premise is also a form of words. However, as in modern philosophical logic, it means that which is asserted by the sentence. Writers before Frege and Russell, such as Bradley, sometimes spoke of the judgment as something distinct from a sentence, but this is not quite the same. As a further confusion the word sentence derives from the Latin, meaning an opinion or judgment, and so is equivalent to proposition. The logical quality of a proposition is whether it is affirmative or negative. Thus every philosopher is mortal is affirmative, since the mortality of philosophers is affirmed universally whereas no philosopher is mortal is negative by denying such mortality in particular. The quantity of a proposition is whether it is universal or particular. In case where existential import is assumed, quantification implies the existence of at least one subject, unless disclaimed. Singular terms, for Aristotle, the distinction between singular and universal is a fundamental metaphysical one, and not merely grammatical. A singular term for Aristotle is primary substance, which can only be predicated of itself, Callias, or Socrates are not predicable of any other thing, thus one does not say every Socrates one says every human. It may feature as a grammatical predicate, as in the sentence the person coming this way is Callias. But it is still a logical subject. He contrasts universal secondary substance, genera, with primary substance, particular specimens. The formal nature of universals, in so far as they can be generalized always, or for the most part, are the subject matter of both scientific study and formal logic. The essential feature of the syllogistic is that, of the four terms in the two premises, one must occur twice. Thus, all Greeks are men, all men are mortal. The subject of one premise, must be the predicate of the other and so it is necessary to eliminate from the logic any terms which cannot function both as subject and predicate, namely singular terms. However, in a popular 17th century version of the syllogistic, Port Royal logic, singular terms were treated as universals, all men are mortals, all Socrates are men, all Socrates are mortals, 
This is clearly awkward, a weakness exploited by Frege in his devastating attack on the system. The famous syllogism Socrates is a man is frequently quoted as though from Aristotle, but fact, it is nowhere in the Organon. It is first mentioned by Sextus Empiricus in his Hip. Piri. 164. Influence on philosophy. Decline of term logic. Term logic began to decline in Europe during the Renaissance, when logicians like Rodolphus Agricola Frisius and Ramus began to promote place logics. The logical tradition called Port Royal logic, or sometimes traditional logic, saw propositions as combinations of ideas rather than of terms, but otherwise followed many of the conventions of term logic. It remained influential, especially in England, until the 19th century. Leibniz created a distinctive logical calculus, but nearly all of his work on logic remained unpublished and unremarked until Louis Cochrat went through the Leibniz Nachlass around 1900, publishing his pioneering studies in logic. 19th century attempts to algebraize logic, such as the work of Boole and Venn, typically yielded systems highly influenced by the term logic tradition. The first predicate logic was that of Frege's landmark Begriffsschrift. Little read before 1950, in part because of its eccentric notation. Modern predicate logic as we know it began in the 1880s with the writings of Charles Sanders Park, who influenced Pino and even more, Ernst Schraparagraph Dare. It reached fruition in the hands of Bertrand Russell and A. N. Whitehead, whose Principia Mathematica made use of a variant of Pino's predicate logic. Term logic also survived to some extent in traditional Roman Catholic education, especially in seminaries. Medieval Catholic theology, especially the writings of Thomas Aquinas, had a powerfully Aristotelian cast, and thus term logic became a part of Catholic theological reasoning. For example, Joyce's Principles of Logic, written for use in Catholic seminaries, made no mention of Frege or of Bertrand Russell. Revival some philosophers have complained that predicate logic is unnatural in a sense, in that its syntax does not follow the syntax of the sentences that figure in our everyday reasoning. It is, as Quine acknowledged, Procrustean, employing an artificial language of function and argument, quantifier, and bound variable. Suffers from theoretical problems, probably the most serious being empty names and identity statements. Even academic philosophers entirely in the mainstream, such as Gareth Evans, have written as follows, I come to semantic investigations with a preference for homophonic theories. Theories which try to take serious account of the syntactic and semantic devices which actually exist in the language. I would prefer, such a theory. Over a theory which is only able to deal with, sentences of the form all A's are B's by discovering hidden logical constants. The objection would not be that such, G and truth conditions are not correct, but that, in a sense which we would all dearly love to have more exactly explained, the syntactic shape of the sentence is treated as so much misleading surface structure. See also Notes References Bokonski, I.M., 1951 Ancient Formal Logic North Holland Louis Kocherat, 1961 La logic de Leibniz. Hildesheim, Georg Ohms Verlagsbuch Handlung. Gareth Evans, 1977, Pronouns, Quantifiers and Relative Clauses, Canadian Journal of Philosophy. Peter Jeech, 1976. Reason and Argument. University of California Press. Hammond and Scullard, 1992. The Oxford Classical Dictionary. Oxford University Press. ISBN 0-19-869117-3. Joyce, George Hayward, 1949. Principles of Logic, 3rd ed. Longmans. A manual written for use in Catholic seminaries. Authoritative on traditional logic, with many references to medieval and ancient sources. Contains no hint of modern formal logic. The author lived 1864-1943. Jan Lucas Eich, 1951. Aristotle's Syllogistic, from the Standpoint of Modern Formal Logic. Oxford University. Press. John Stuart Mill, 1904. 
A System of Logic, 8th ed. London. Parry and Hacker, 1991. Aristotelian Logic. State University of New York Press. Arthur Pryor, 1962, Formal Logic, 2nd ed. Oxford University. Press. While primarily devoted to modern formal logic, contains much on term and medieval logic. 1976, The Doctrine of Propositions and Terms. Peter Geech and A. J. P. Kenny, eds. London, Duckworth. Willard Quine, 1986. Philosophy of Logic 2nd ed. Harvard University. Press. Rose, Lynn E., 1968. Aristotle's Syllogistic. Springfield, Clarence C. Thomas. Summers, Fred, 1970, The Calculus of Terms, Mind 79, 1-39. Reprinted in Ingler Bretson, G., ed., 1987. The New Syllogistic New York, Peter Lang. ISBN 0-8204-0448-9, 1982. The Logic of Natural Language. Oxford University Press. 1990, Predication in the Logic of Terms, Notre Dame Journal of Formal Logic 31, 106-26, and Ingler Bretson, George, 2000, An Invitation to Formal Reasoning. The Logic of Terms. Aldershot UK, Ashgate. ISBN 0-7546-1366-6. Sir Lawn, 2008. Numerical Term Logic. Lewiston, Edwin Mellon Press. External links, Term Logic at Phil Papers, Aristotle's Logic Entry by Robin Smith in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Term Logic Entry in the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Aristotle's Term Logic Online This online program provides a platform for experimentation and research on Aristotelian logic. Annotated Bibliographies, Fred Summers. George Ingler Bretson. Planet Math, Aristotelian Logic. Interactive Syllogistic Machine for Term Logic A web-based syllogistic machine for exploring fallacies, figures, terms, and modes of syllogisms.